Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday evening services here at Ferris Baptist Fellowship. We have begun uh, an ongoing series. It'll be not a long series, but at least a little bit, uh, uh, maybe three or four weeks, on ordinary people that God uses. Uh, we're using for our main verse for this study a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And here's why he did it. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now listen, God uses people that are obscure, people that other people may not have heard of people that just spontaneously appear on the scene in the Bible that we don't know anything about them before and we don't know anything about them after, but we see God use them in powerful ways. And so we're going to look at some figures like that in the weeks ahead. Tonight, I've got four of them for you. And the first one is a man named Her. Of the three men named Her in the Bible, the most well-known appears in the book of Exodus. He's described as being from the tribe of Judah. Uh, and he's often mentioned in conjunction with Aaron, Moses' brother, and, and the, who was the high priest of the Israelites. Uh, and it's also likely that he had a place of authority, and I'll explain that as we go along here. He's one of the two men who held up Moses' arms during the Israelites' battle against the Amalekites. When the Amalekites attacked the Israelites on the way to the Promised Land, Moses stood up on a hill overlooking the battle, staff in his hand, and he raised his arms, but what happened when he lowered his arms, the battle started going against the Israelites and in favor of the Amalekites. So uh, when Moses' arms grew tired, he sat on a stone, and Aaron and Hur stood beside him to hold up his arms. But, but uh, And here's the passage out of Exodus chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Previously, when Moses had ascended Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, he left Aaron and Hur in charge of the people. They did a poor job because when Moses came back down from the mountain, he found that the people had uh, created a golden calf to worship in place of the Lord. Aaron himself had cast that idol. While Hur's involvement is not really clear, he appears to be either complicit or complacent in the matter, and neither of those are good things. The last piece of information the Bible gives us of Hur in the Bible is that he is the grandfather of Basilel, which we're going to look at next. That's in Exodus chapter 31. Basilel was a craftsman who was filled with God's spirit, and he oversaw the construction of the tabernacle and the ark of God. According to one tradition, now these are traditions, people. Don't nail this down as truth. But Jewish tradition had him married to Moses' sister Miriam. Another tradition says that he was Miriam's son. Yet another tradition was that her was, he's standing up against the idolaters of Mount Sinai, and they, and he mur they murdered him because he stood against them after which Aaron was much more com compliant with the crowd's standards. Wh whichever one was true, there's just some tradition following her. And the point I'm trying to make is that he's fairly obscure to those of us who read and study our Bible, but actually he has a prominent place in things, uh, important things that he did. So let's move on to his grandson, Basilel. His name means in the shadow of God. That's a pretty good name, isn't it? He was a master craftsman under Moses, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. God gave him special wisdom and skill for his task, which was, with the aid of Aholiab of the tribe of Dan, to superintend the making of the tabernacle and its furniture. Now, here's what's really kind of cool about this story. These two guys, Bezalel and Aholiab, are going to map out and make uh, what God gives to Moses as the blueprint for the tabernacle. Now, mind you, they don't have written plans. 
They didn't go over to the city council and get it approved for code. You know, they're putting this thing much like Noah did with the ark. You know, I mean, what boggles my mind about the ark, for example, is he'd never seen a boat, you know, and so God gave all that to him to know how to build it. But anyway, God does the same thing here to the children of Israel, and he uses Bezalel and Aholiab as the two guys who are going to do that. Now, I take it that Bezalel was more like the general foreman, and, uh, and uh, Aholiab was more like the, the contractor who, who gets the trades and the work together. So Bezalel would be like the over the whole kind of thing, and Aholiab is the guy who's actually going to uh, cause everything to, to get done. Both of them are given special abilities by God to do this. So, uh, after God rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, he instructed Moses to build a tent where his presence would reside while the Israelites traveled about the homeland. That's in Exodus 25. Uh, the instructions were highly detailed, including exact measurements and a long list of materials to be used. Now, anybody who's ever built something knows that that's nice to have, <laughs> but that ain't building it up. You know, it still has to be built, and that's the job of Bezalel and Aholiab. And he says in Exodus 31, verse 2, and then again in verse 6, he says, See, I have called by name Bezalel. I have appointed with him Aholiab, and I have given to, to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So he was, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God, which is a rare occurrence in the Old Testament. That's Exodus 31.3. God also gifted him a special ability and intelligence with all knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. Aholiab was from the tribe of Dan. So Bezalel's from Judah. Aholiab's from Dan. And uh, he was known as an engraver and designer and embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns, yarns and fine twisted or uh, twined linen. That's Exodus 38:23. So Holiab was an artisan whose skill God planned to use in helping build the tabernacle. So the biblical account records that God inspired both of them to teach others. That's Exodus 35:34. Now here's the genius of this. So God gets these two guys aside, Bezalel who's got all kinds of abilities and got the presence of the spirit of God with him to help him you know, lay this thing out. Aholiab, who is skilled in all this fine work and craftsmanship, and then they're going to train others. Now, Kay and I like to watch this old house. And one of the things we admire about that DIY show, which has been around for a long, long time now, uh, one of the things we like about that show is how skilled these craftsmen are, and they have various areas of expertise. You've got a plumber, you've got a builder, you've got a gardener, you've got, you know, somebody who's kind of good at the whole thing. Uh, and it's kind of fun to watch them, but they're all getting older. And now they're taking apprentices. And we get to see some of them when we watch the show. That's what this was. You know, now we're spreading the skill level out and teaching others to do this also. And so the tabernacle is about God's presence being there, and it's got to be made well because this thing's going to last all the way up to the time of Solomon. I mean, from the time they're in the wilderness to the time of Solomon, this tent of meeting is going to be somewhere. Now, that's a long time. So it's got to last a long time, and God's presence is going to be there, but it's going to be used to spread out the skill level in the house of Israel so that people can learn some, get this magic word, trades, so that they can become artisans and skilled in various things. Well, there's so many things to learn about, you know, how God works using these two guys, Bezalel and Aholiab. Let me give you three things, or four things, rather. First of all, we learn from them that God stirs in the hearts of people to be involved in his work. No one should be coerced into giving or serving. When Paul was instructing the Corinthians, he wrote, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's 2 Corinthians 9, 7. The Israelites generously gave an abundance toward the tabernacle, and God stirred in their hearts to do the work as well, so none of it was coerced or under compulsion. Secondly, all skill can be used for God's glory. The tabernacle needed craftsmen like woodworkers, weavers, and metalsmiths, as well as artisans, 
like embroiderers and jewelers. There was purpose for the skills God had given the people. Third, we see how much God values beauty and order. Uh, years ago, we, there's a mock-up of the tabernacle that goes around the country. I think it's home-based in Indiana, if I remember right. Uh, but it came down to San Antonio all around 2005 or six, somewhere in there. And so we packed up a couple of truckloads of people and went down there to see the tabernacle. And even a copy of it now, you just stand there kind of in awe of what this must have been like and how beautiful it was. But it was a magnificently beautiful place. And everything had a, a, a place that it belonged. It was all put together. Now remember, one of the things about this tent was you had to be able to pack it all up and carry it away. Because the thing was, when God's presence was there, which was symbolized either a cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night, as long as it stayed there, the people stayed there. But when either of those things moved, they moved. Now, you know, they're all in tents. God's presence is over in a tent. So it's like pack up shop and let's move. So <laughs> that's amazing to me. The order that it takes to do that. Anybody ever been on a camping trip? I mean, it'd take us three days to get out the door just going on a camping trip. Now, people who are used to that and doing a lot, they can do it a lot faster. But typically... It's not easy. So I appreciate personally how God values beauty and order. Every detailed part of that tabernacle, right down into the minutia of things, uh, God organized and gave and put into the hearts of somebody. It wasn't a simple or utilitarian design, by the way, but one that had beauty and splendor to it. And fourth, from them we can learn uh, that they taught others. You know, discipleship at its heart is this, teaching others. Uh, they were supposed to equip the people and then delegate different tasks to those who were able to do them. My job, my calling, according to Philippians 4, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You know, I'm supposed to be showing you how to do the things, and then you're supposed to go do them. And that's what's going on here. Not that I'm not supposed to do them, but I'm supposed to be showing you how to do the things that are involved in ministry. Uh, and so leadership in, in includes enabling and encouraging others to join you in a task rather than trying to do all the tasks yourself. And I promise you, when you're the pastor of a small church, you feel that tension a lot more clearly than you do if you're pastoring a larger church. Because there's so many jobs to do, that's X, so many people Y, and X doesn't always equal Y. And so the tendency of the pastor is always to try to do more. But if you're going to be a good pastor, you have to let people take responsibility and let them do their job. Miriam is our next character tonight. She's our last one for tonight. Now, you know, you say, well, she's not a nobody. Well, not a nobody, but let's look at what happens here. She came from obscurity. Uh, she is Moses' older sister, and she's called Mo Miriam the prophetess in Exodus 15:20. And she plays an, a, an important role in several episodes in Moses' life uh, and in the exodus of uh, Israel from Egypt. Uh, she is the one who's walking along the banks, watching her baby brother in a basket among the bulrushes, you know, trending on down the Nile until Moses', I mean, uh, Pharaoh's daughter happens to catch an eye on it, has her handmaids fish Moses out of the river. And, uh, and then she's there when... Uh, when the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh needs a wet nurse, uh, Miriam steps up and says, I know somebody. Uh, and so, you know, she's important in that. Uh, and that's, you can read about that back in Exodus chapter 1 through uh, chapter 2, verse 4. And so I, I have to tell you, that little story right there always just kind of blows my mind when I think about it on so many levels. First of all, remember what's happening is the Pharaohs order the death of all the babies among the Israelite children because they're, they're exploding in population. Uh, and there's uh, like 2 million of those, uh, you know, Jewish babies, you know, I mean, Jewish people running around and Pharaoh recognizes there's more of them than there are of us. And that isn't going to be a good thing. And so he orders the two midwives, you know, to start, uh, you know, whoops, drop the baby, you know, uh, or making sure that the babies aren't born. And the midwives, of course, did not do that. And God rewarded them for that. 
But Moses survives because his mother puts him adrift out into the Nile River there. Now think about the, the Nile River for a second. Or any river for that matter. First of all, she's got to build something that will actually float. Uh, and then it's got to float on a river. And it's got to float on a river with things that go boom in the night in there. And uh, with things that crocodiles and stuff like that. You know, there. how many things could go wrong with that picture? But God's providence guides that baby's basket down there and lo and behold it's pharaoh's daughter that pulls him in what are the chances oy vey <laughs> that it's going to be pharaoh's daughter that pulls in the deliverer of israel but anyway miriam's a key factor in that and she just sort of burst on the bible scene there with this uh, together god uses moses miriam and aaron to lead the people of israel from slavery in egypt to the promised land in Canaan. After they miraculously cross the Red Sea on dry ground and they see the Egyptian army overthrown in the sea, Miriam leads a, the woman's chorale in a song. <laughs> and you can read about this over in Exodus chapter 15. Here's a couple of words out of it. Sing to the Lord for he is mighty, he's exalted. Both the horse and the rider he's hurled into the sea. And it's a wonderful piece of literature too if you just want to read that. I would encourage that. In the same passage, she's given the title prophetess, the first of only a handful of the whole Bible, women in the whole Bible, who are identified that way. By the way, just so you know, the others who are identified as prophetess are Deborah in Judges 4.4, Huldah in 2 Kings 22.14, Isaiah's wife in Isaiah 8.3, Anna in Luke 2.36, and Philip's four daughters in Acts chapter 21, verse 9. Unfortunately, Miriam later falls into a spirit of complaining. Both Miriam and, and I think it's because she watched so many soap operas among the children of Israel, <laughs> frankly. Uh, both Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses for marrying a Cushite or Ethiopian women, woman, but Miriam is listed first in Numbers 12.1, so it's likely she instigated the complaint. While the complaint was ostensibly against Moses' wife, the discontent ran deeper, which, by the way, shows you that something was always simmering there. It just burbles up to the surface here. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? Numbers 12, 2. In other words, what are we, chopped liver? <laughs> yeah, we've been here. He gets all the credit. We're in the background. Well, God was angry that Miriam and Aaron were so willing to speak against the servant he had chosen, so he struck Miriam with leprosy. Aaron, realizing the foolishness of her, their words, repented of his sin, and Moses, ever the intercessor, prayed on behalf of his sister. Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. That's Numbers 12, 13. After a week-long quarantine, Miriam was healed and rejoined the camp. As Miriam's leprosy convicted Aaron of the foolish words they'd spoken against God's chosen servant, it should also remind us not to judge those around us or live in jealousy when God's given a specific call to someone else. Well, Miriam had an opportunity to show the people of Israel what it meant to live in love as a servant of God without complaining, and for most of her life she did. But she failed in the matter of Moses' wife, we too have opportunities to show the grumblers and complainers around us what it's like to be a servant of Jesus Christ. So let us draw them to Jesus through our love and servanthood and not be drawn away from him ourselves. You know, complaining, murmuring, is like a, a, it's like a, one of those viruses that goes around. You get that in the camp and you start sucking that wind down yourself, you're going to catch that virus. It's good to stay away from people who are grumblers and complainers because you're going to catch it if you're not careful. Well, because of their grumbling and lack of faith in God, the first generation of Israelites uh, failed to, uh, to get into the promised land. And that included the prophetess Miriam. Most of that older generation had already died in the wilderness when Israel comes back to Kadesh where they had started their wandering. It's here that Miriam dies and is buried in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Hers was a life of responsibility and service of God's calling and providence, yet it also reminds us that no one is too important to receive God's discipline for personal sin. I want to camp on that a second. 
There are people who think they have risen above sin, who serve God. And we read about them. I read about one today. Uh, somebody down in uh, Louisiana, big old church in, outside New Orleans there, was skimming money off the top, you know, from the church and from other ministries that he had. Why would he do that? Well, because he thought he could do it with impunity, that God wouldn't notice and that God wouldn't do anything. You never, in secular circles, we say this, no one's above the law, not even the president of the United States. But in Bible circles, what we say is nobody is beyond holiness. In other words, that's God's call upon our life. Be holy for I am holy. And to the degree that we are not holy, often God will invade our lives with discipline. He's trying to help us, not hurt us. And so we need to realize that you don't escape that just because, you know, you're all that. So I'll give you a couple of passages of scripture here. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Or how about Romans 12, 3. For by the grace of given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So my friends, here's four people tonight that basically just burst on the scene and then they're gone. But God used them all in big ways. And so what can we learn? Well, one of the things we can learn is that just because you think nobody knows your name, God does. Just because you think God may never use you, that doesn't mean he won't. And just because you're serving away in ignominy and nobody knows who you are, but you're just faithful in your Baptist church, don't discount the importance of that. Two things always come to my mind when I'm thinking about obscurity. Who was the man that led Billy Graham to Jesus? Nobody can tell you. Who was the man who taught uh, <coughs> Dwight L. Moody? about the Lord. Here are two of the greatest evangelists that have ever lived. But you couldn't tell me who it was that led them to the Lord. But I want to tell you, whoever it was led them to the Lord, God counted him faithful to bear that news. And God used them in big and powerful ways. So even though they're not there, their shadow echoes off into the future, even to today. And wouldn't you really have rather have that? And everybody know your name, but they might know it for reasons that aren't all that good. <laughs> well, so I hope that you'll enjoy this series as we go because I'm enjoying putting it together. It reminds me of how we ought to all be encouraged that God does and will use those people who are lesser known or who maybe nobody else knows or everybody's counted out. And we're even going to see a notorious sinner or two in this bunch. So stay tuned. If you have any questions or comments about this, or you just want to know more about the Lord, or if you want some questions answered, feel free to call us here at the church, 972-544-3564. You can drop us a line at P.O. Box 203, Ferris, Texas, 75125. Or, better yet, you can come to church. We're at 809 East 8th Street and in Ferris, Texas, and uh, our services are at 9. 45 for Bible study and 11 o'clock for church. And we'd love to have you come and visit with us. Thank you so much for joining with us tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time we've had together in your word. And I pray, Lord, that constantly and ever we'll take the encouragement you offer up when you show us how you do big and powerful things with people who aren't. And we're grateful, Father, that it's all about you. It's uh, And you've done this deliberately, Lord so that no man may boast before you, but that we can all rejoice that you are a great and mighty God who would do things like this. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Have a good evening.